Welcome to a discussion that explores the creation and staging of a street performance in Portland, Maine called Gaza Bleeds. My name is Tim Paradis, and I and my colleagues Shelley and Steve are involved with the grassroots group Maine Voices for Palestinian Rights. MVPR is engaged in public education and advocacy in support of justice and human rights for the Palestinian people. Gaza Bleeds was performed during the summer and fall of 2018 in downtown Portland. The silent drama recreates the scene at the Gaza border fence with Israel, where 200 protesters were killed in the past six months and over 18,000 wounded and maimed by Israeli army snipers. The dead included many young teenagers, as well as medics and journalists wearing visible symbols identifying themselves as such. Most people living in Gaza are individuals and family members of, of Palestinians expelled from their land and homes by Israel. And Gaza has been called the world's biggest open air prison, where access to everything from food to medicine to water is controlled by Israel. The protests by the people of Gaza and the killing and maiming by Israeli arm, army snipers are ongoing. We're going to turn now to show the video and then we'll discuss its creation. This short drama about recent sniper shootings in Gaza is part of a much larger narrative. For over 100 years, Palestinians have been steadily pushed off their land and oppressed by a variety of unjust, often brutal, practices and laws. The U.S. government, as Israel's top supporter via military aid and diplomatic backing, has acted against its own national interests. A more balanced approach that at last takes into account the political and human rights and the security needs of Palestinians will vastly improve chances for a stable and peaceful Middle East. To start our conversation, Shelley and Steve, could you tell me just something briefly about yourself and when and how you first became aware of the plight of the Palestinian people and the Palestinian cause? Do you want to start, Steve? About myself, uh, what just I do? Just briefly. Yeah, I, I, I'm an actor, director. I do. I narrate audio books. I play music. Um, okay. This sort of thing. And I first uh, learned about it through my brother, actually, and back in. I think it was probably the, the, the early 80s. Um, and he had been uh, investigating these uh, old London Times articles uh, up at the University of Maine in Orono and looking at microfiche from these old things. And he began to understand what had gone on in those early days um, of, uh, of Israel's formation as a state. 
And so um, I, I sort of listened to him, and it was, I'd always thought of it as kind of this problem over there that I didn't know anything about, and you know, I felt sorry for everyone. And I began to understand what the history was. And once I began to look at the history, I began to be very interested in it and to begin to have a, an informed opinion. And Shelley? Um, I first learned about it also in the early 80s. <clears throat> um, a friend from college who was very political, a very smart guy, and he was all torn up about uh, the Palestinian situation and was doing everything he could on campus to generate awareness and how to support uh, the Palestinians being so far away. Um, also at a pretty conservative college, I'd say. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I, I think of myself as a political person, but I actually don't follow politics. I don't really understand the structure of the government. I'm, so I'm not very political from that point of view, but I certainly care about people. And so as the years went by, uh, you know, I didn't really know much about the Middle East or the geographics and the cultures. It always seemed very foreign to me. So it was sort of another form of removal in a way. But um, in recent years, I have just been around more people who are also very intelligent and aware and know the history. And so I've been able to learn more again. And then I came to know um, all of you who were first involved with Main Voices for Palestinian Rights. And, um, and of course, uh, Bob Scheibel, who has been so, you know, car carried the weight of that group by himself practically for a decade, um, now that I see what he's doing organizationally, I'm so grateful for because I'm not that organized, but if I can get involved in an organization that's doing that part and I can show up and bring what I know how to bring, I'm very happy about that. And so that's how I've landed here. Thank you. And fast forwarding and picking up on this notion of being organized and doing stuff out in the public. How do you recollect that uh, Gaza Bleeds was first thought of? What were the first conversations that led to its creation, if you, if you recall? I, I, I can remember, and I'm not sure whether it was you or Bob Scheibel who, who, who first brought it up to me, but said, well, we're, we're thinking about doing some kind of dramatic presentation, and we thought of you because you have some experience in theater as a director. And, um, and then we started meeting a, a few of us, four, five, five of us, was it? And um, regularly, it was usually Tuesday mornings at that point um, at a downtown uh, place in Portland and just discussing how this thing would, might, might look. Yeah, at first we thought about it being just a tableau. And the, and the way we got to that was because so many people, we were first do, um, doing the street corners, handing out, um, pamphlets and making signs just to bring sort of poster notes to people's awareness about what's going on in Israel and Palestine. And, um, and so many people would come to me and say, what are you doing that for, friends? How do you think that has any effect on anybody? I, I don't think anyone pays any attention to that. And I started to get the feeling that people actually had an aversion to it. And so then <laughs> we started to think, how could we... Um, connect with people at more of a heartfelt way instead of, um, you know, I don't know what it is that turns some people off, but um, not everybody is, but some people were. And so we were just trying to think of how to reach more people. And we came up with the idea of doing the tableau. And then it kind of grew, maybe from you, Stephen, about actually putting some action into it or movement or words. And so we played around with that mm -hmm. idea until... Um, what we saw on the screen was born. And there, there, was the, was the, there was a discussion at some point as to whether there should be, a tableau is where people don't move, and uh, right. a silent drama is where people move but they don't speak, and then a drama t typically has dialogue. And, uh, and so we, we, we played around with the idea of no movement, uh, you know, movement without, so, and, and then we, we came up with basically movement without words. Yes. Uh, and as I recall, the, the, the one sound that we needed, or at least we felt that we needed, was that sound of, we didn't want to use guns, 
is, you know, fake guns, obviously, because who, who knows what in this, you know, any day and age, but particularly this one, people might think if they saw even toy guns out in public like that. So we, so we, we, we lit on a gesture, mm -hmm. but it needed some kind of a, a, a voice accentuating the gesture. And so, so I was the one who was, who was chosen to be the person, okay, you want to do it? You do it. And, and made a kind of a, a loud, violent noise with, just with my voice. We'll delve into some of the theatrical aspects of this a little further, yeah. but I'm wondering if either of you had been involved with what I'll call agitprop theater in the past, or what sources of inspiration in terms of this kind of street theater with a social or political message were sources of inspiration? Well, the, I've never, I don't think I've ever done, I may have somewhere deep in my memory that's gone, I've done street theater. I mean, I was, I was around for all those big protests of the, the late 60s and early 70s in DC. Um, but the specific theater that I've done that connected with this issue was two, two pieces. Um, my name is Rachel Corey and uh, seven Jewish children. Seven, right, I think. Um, and I actually, uh, Tim, you, you, you worked on that with me and that was presented in various uh, locations around Portland and, and Brunswick and Boston. It was a, a reading, but it was a reading done by a lot of people. There was originally just basically Rachel Corey who died under a, a bulldozer that she was standing up to prevent from going in, destroying a Palestinian home. Um, uh, and the bulldozer didn't stop and she was killed. And it was her diaries written before and so, but we broke it up into a lot of different voices of all, of you know, both sexes and all ages. And it was kind of effective because it wasn't just about this one girl, it was about standing up for something and, and what happens. And Shelley, as Gaza Bleeds was being formed, were you thinking about other street performances that you had seen or how did, uh, um, I have seen street theater, which I think is really exciting. And uh, I am an artist and an actor, and I have not done anything like that before, but I love the idea of you know, connecting the arts to politics, I think is a, a great resource. Um, otherwise, I'm painting landscapes. And <laughs> <laughs> Trying to forget politics. Flowers, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's wonderful to bridge those things. A lot of people do, but I hadn't, so I was happy to be a part of that, too. And Steve, you started talking about the theatrical aspects of this. Um, what were some of the elements that you were thinking about uh, to make it most effective, to engage folks that support MVPR, uh, and to reach out to the public? What were some of the elements that... Uh, well, it was necessary. We knew that it would be necessary to have something in the way of signage because a lot of people would have no idea if we just showed. Um, so there, there were signs, but they were used, we hope, judicially, um, judiciously, I should say, um, at, at certain points in this. But it, it was to be some basic action with a, you know, we needed, we needed a barrier. So um, someone got some chicken wire. I think it might have been you, Tim. And we needed... Um, we needed to somehow, uh, we had the Palestinians basically dressed in, in red uh, to make it clear visually that these were people and they were on the other side of this barrier. And, um, and we had them fall in an obvious way as if they were, you know, had been shot. And I was there prancing around, you know, being the, the sniper. And, um, and then we had someone come and, and lay a, a white sheet, a, the bloodied white sheet on each of them. Um, a, 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 so it was, it, was, it was supposed to, yeah, I mean, I, those were the theatrical elements. We, we had to choose what, what would be readable, what would read from a distance, too, because, you know, people, we were hoping to attract people who were just passing by, usually on an art walk Friday, I believe, yep. pretty much, yeah. And then we carried over that red and black theme to the signs, too, which we made a lot of signs. And we spent some time thinking about, um, you know, what, 
what messaging we wanted to do with that. And mm -hmm. um, I think traditionally, um, you know, signs have been angry and not that we aren't angry about what's happening, but also we don't want to shut people out. And so we're, we're trying to reach people from, uh, you know, really try to get the heart of everybody to respond to this crisis, which essentially everybody I think ought to be concerned about. And so um, we don't want to push people away. We want to be thoughtful about what we're communicating. And uh, the red and black theme, I think, is dramatic, even for the signage. And so we use that. And um, one of the signs, or some of the signs that I made, we made, we literally wrote down the names of the people who had been killed at the border. Uh, a, many, many of them. A who, few of them. Well, wow. Yes. <laughs> Well, we had the list, but we only did 30 to represent yeah. the greater number. I mean, I mean, in our hearts, we were writing all of them because we did it with such care and thought, and we had all the names. Um, so many of them were, of course, young people, too. But when I did that, I, I used a calligraphy, uh, partly because I was trying to uh, think about what we do when we have something that we care about, any kind of an event, whether it be a funeral or a wedding, we often will use a thoughtful script. And so I did that, um, trying to communicate that these are not just um, you know, some enemy lives that were lost. These were real people who were really loved by their family and only uh, you know, coming up to the border, uh, hoping to communicate or make a connection with someone to uh, you know, get back some basic rights, just basic humanity. So anyway, what I mean to say in all that is, I think um, what we think about and the intention that we give to things makes a big difference in a cause like this. And I see a lot of people who care a lot about people, even people we don't know, but people who are suffering. And so um, that's sort of what motivates me and excites me. Uh, is being around so many caring people, for one thing, in a world that's full of hate. And as you see on the video, there were other actors involved. Can you speak to your work with them, Steve? Because you were primarily responsible for orienting, orienting them and directing them. Yes. As they say, it was like herding cats. Um, Th there were. Uh, it was that bad. Th I was. I, th I thought the people who played the Palestinians <laughs> is that bad? No, it's not bad. It's just <laughs> difficult. Uh, the Palestinians uh, who were killed were. Um, they each of them uh, uh, clearly felt a, a lot about this. I mean, to to give that time on on a Friday to come out and you know put yourself in front of a lot of people, many of whom may not exactly see eye to eye with you. And to put out, you know, this, they, these were not theater people necessarily. These were not, these weren't people used to doing anything in public. But they, I mean, I was, I was amazed at how, um, how much looking at them, uh, particularly on the video, and and at the time too, um, how much they communicated of, of that moment of, of a person, an unarmed person, being shot. Uh, you know, and just, and you know, it, it, was, it was amazing. I thought they did a wonderful job. And everyone seemed very, uh, they, if we needed more people to carry signs or fewer people to, you know, whatever, that people were, were happy to give it a try. It was not the easiest thing. It would not be that easy for me to, to fall down as if I suddenly had no legs under me on stone, which is where we, we, we did the stone or brick. And, and everyone, no matter what age, found a way to, to, uh, to crumple, you know, and, and sometimes it looked like they were lying themselves down very, laying themselves down very carefully, but, um, but the, it, was, it was a great effort. I mean, the people threw their hearts into it. It was, it was nice. And what is your recollection of the response of passers-by, the audience, as it were, to the first time this was staged? I recall that it was on a first Friday in Monument Square, and I think we got the timing wrong, so there weren't that many people around. Um, but any thoughts about uh, the engagement with the public? Yeah, I wasn't at the first one, but I was at the second one. <clears throat> and I was um, 
happily surprised to see how many people approached our table who stopped and were really watching. And um, because I was holding the sign, so I wasn't necessarily, I was holding the, actually the edge of the chicken wire fence, you know, the barrier. And I was able to really watch people. And so I was um, happy uh, to see that people were um, engaged, I guess, and um, really watching and what appeared to be contemplating what was going on. Um, that's different than when we're passing out pamphlets on the corner on Fridays, which you know we did all summer. Um, so very different response. Um, that's what I noticed. Yeah, I mean the the great thing is that when you're when when you're performing, when you're doing a performance, people are not only they they're not only allowed to they're inc people are encouraged to just look at something. They're not being approached, and anything nothing is being asked of them directly. Will you sign this? Do you know about this? It's just, we can just look at this from a distance and be, there's a separation between us, which allows, I think, people to feel more free to look at it and to find out what's going on. Because I, I don't care what it is, if someone comes up on the street with something, I mean, now I usually look, because frequently there are petitions I want to sign. <laughs> I won't, st but the, the initial thing is, no, I've got other things to do. Because I just don't, I don't want to, you know, I'm. But yeah, that's, that's a great thing about, about something that has some uh, a visual, but not, not, a, uh, um, uh, not, a, uh, not a need to, to, to engage. Which, and it's why in, in theater, you know, a lot of people don't like theater when the actors engage the public. It's like, I came to watch this. I didn't come to be part of your show. <laughs> and in this case, people were, were able to just watch. Yeah. And I believe that Gaza Bleeds has been performed four or five times to date in downtown Portland. Mm -hmm. Over the course of that time frame, have elements of the piece changed significantly or at all, and in what ways? Either the script or yeah. really the way that the message is being presented. Well, the, the big thing that I remember that we wanted that didn't seem to be getting across in the first one was that the moment of the shooting. Uh, just pointing at someone it didn't seem to be. So I, I remember that that, was, that that was a big thing, that you to make some sort of a noise. And <laughs> when, we, when we performed down, pretty much we, I think we performed each time except once in Monument Square. And the, the ones that we went down to Commercial Street between Rira and, and the, uh, the ferry, it was a different, I mean, there were people coming off cruise ships and, and with, little, with little kids, and, and it was, uh, um, so, uh, someone was quite angry that I was making a loud noise, said it was, it was, just, it was uh, frightening people. So, you know, you have to choose your venue and, and say, well, maybe it's not so bad that you're frightened by a noise of someone yelling if you find out what it is and what it's about, and it's actually about not people yelling somewhere, it's about people killing other people. You know, so. No. Any other Do observations? Do you remember any differences in the, the presentation? No, because I only did the one, so oh, I, you I, I wish yeah. I could speak to the others, yeah. We'll probably have a minute to yeah. come back to any yeah. concluding thoughts, but yeah. um, I just have some end mm -hmm. remarks. Uh, first, some notes of thanks to Martha Spies for filming and editing the Gaza Bleeds video to the Portland Media Center, where this is being taped, for both filming this discussion and for giving the, us this venue to show the, the, uh, the film, and to The Struggle, which is a TV show hosted by Stan Heller, which is bringing this message to 20 community TV stations around New England and New York City. Uh, if you are inspired or interested by the video and this discussion, you're welcome to contact Maine Voices for Palestinian Rights. You can visit the webpage, which is mvpr.org, or contact us by email at mvprights at gmail.com. Um, as we move forward, the killing continues at the border fence with Gaza. The oppression of the Palestinian people continues. The search for 
a just and fair solution to their plight is still a long way off. So I'd like to quote something that was sent to us by one of the staffers at the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights to put this in the broader context. He wrote, at a time when the connections between domestic U.S. struggles for justice and the Palestinian freedom struggle are clearer than ever, Gaza Bleeds shows us all that we have choices. We can resist, we can educate, we can use public space to highlight injustice. Gaza Bleeds reminds us of the appalling human cost of Israel's aggression against the unarmed Palestinian protesters and asks us to think about what more each of us can do to urge our government to end its complicity in Israeli abuses. We still have a couple more minutes. Any other plans for such street performance? Uh, I know you're aware of what you I think recall, might, might be worth, worth, worth pursuing. I recall being, being asked uh, probably two months ago to look into other, other possible script ideas and, and how we might, because I, I'm always big on, on let, what is the history. People, if people in this country knew the history, they would not support our, our, our government supporting this, what's been going on. So the history, so how do you make a history of basically a century um, clear? So that, and I haven't quite gotten around to doing that script. Any final thoughts, Shelley? Because we're almost done. Yeah, oh, I agree that there's um, some, some, if we can get some messaging across, it will make, I think it will make a big difference because so many people just don't know both sides, including me for many years. So I understand how confusing it can be. I believe it's a minute. Okay. Well, um, we've we've kind of run out of time. Well, you know, I was I was I was hoping uh, I was I knew that I didn't know what you were going to say with that statement that you read. And right. I was saying, well, the big thing is this country, our country, our tax money is going to support Israel right. and all of its actions. Some of which are things that I think if people knew, they would not be behind and that run directly counter to uh, what I imagine to be the ideals of, of our country. That's right. And international law. Well, thanks to both of you for an interesting conversation. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim.